when I look back over my uh, cr uh, Christian walk over the last uh, 54 years, how time flies, it's unbelievable. Uh, I've learned many things uh, in my Christian walk about uh, how God uh, takes your prayers and interfaces them w with his activity. Uh, and uh, three of the main lessons that I have learned which pertain to this psalm uh, are, number one, uh, is uh, sometimes our bold prayers of faith position us um, in times of great difficulty to save us from a perilous time. Sometimes God does reach down, and when you read the scriptures, in the bold prayer of a righteous saint, it, it takes them out of a difficult time. I've had that happen uh, through a bold prayer. Number two, um, sometimes our bold, bold prayers position you like a Noah for God to take you through the difficult time. Uh, your little ark, your little family, you uh, go through the difficult time, uh, and God provides and spares, spares you huge difficulties, but, but, you're, but you're in the storm, as it were. I've been there as well. Um, the third thing is uh, bold prayers, which is what we're going to find in 116. It is a bold prayer of faith. Uh, bold prayers, sometimes like that of Nehemiah, who was a Jewish slave, who was the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes. Uh, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, he is, uh, his prayer is granted. He hears about how bad things are in Jerusalem, and he's the cupbearer of the king. That means he, whatever the king drinks, he drinks at first. If he dies, they just get another cupbearer. Imagine that job. Uh, and he goes to the king, you know, chapter 1, and tells him, I, my heart breaks for what I see happening to my nation. He prays for his nation, which we all should pray for our nation because prayer matters before God. And then he takes uh, his prayer, and he goes before the king, and the king says, I'm going to make you the cupbearer, the man who redesigns the walls of Jerusalem. Amazing. I mean, it's amazing how God works. So the third way, a bold prayer, God help me heal my nation. Uh, and it turns out to be, he's the head contractor. It's amazing how God works. Has he worked these three ways in your life? Uh, but, the, but the ways of God certainly are not our ways, as Isaiah says, nor his thoughts our thoughts. Uh, we are mortal. Our thinking is limited. He's infinite. Uh, and I've learned to trust him even when uh, he didn't uh, do bold things in my life that I asked him to do. He did other things in my life. Uh, at the end of the day, what does God want us to do? He wants us to uh, be obedient before him at all times, as difficult as that can be. There are times uh, like when uh, Paul uh, prayed for his physical malady to re be removed from him in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, and I believe it was an eye disease. He was losing his eyesight probably from uh, malaria that he contracted in Pamphylia on his first missionary journey. Uh, he was losing his eyesight. Imagine being a great preacher, teacher like him, missionary, and, he, and he's getting to where he can't see. So three times he says, remove this uh, agent of the devil who's buffeting me, and three times God told him what? No, no, my, my grace is sufficient for you because when you're weak, I'm strong. And so I've learned uh, when God sends things my way, um, like a partially autistic son, that can't play sports and can't do academics and all the things I wanted him to do, but he's doing great in other ways now that he's a man. But when God takes you through those things, you have, this was my passage that as I whittle you down, but I will use you greatly. Um, I think it was A.W. Tozer said years ago, God can't use you greatly unless he's hurt you deeply. Such are the ways of God. Uh, but then at other times, uh, God, you, you pray a bold prayer of faith before God, and God uh, opens a prison door, as it were, like he did with, uh, with uh, Paul and Silas when they're locked up. And uh, Acts 16, uh, they're singing praise songs. Uh, I don't know if it was a Tomlin song or whatever it was, but something in the cell block. And they're praying, and God sends a localized earthquake, and all the cell doors just uh, happen to pop open. And, and you, know, you know the story. I mean, don't tell me the scripture is boring. Awesome chapter to read. Uh, and God frees them all. I mean, the head jailer comes to them and says, you know, uh, now what? I'm dead for sure because you guys are all going to escape. And, uh, and Paul took the bad situation with a bold prayer and then leads that guy to Christ and his family. It's unbelievable. So when you look at uh, difficulties, uh, like the, the difficulties that we're facing today as a nation, the difficulties that we see around the world from heartache, like earthquake when it strikes Haiti, uh, God works on all those things. Uh, and he, he takes those things and uses them to his greater glory. Uh, and he accomplishes goals which echo in eternity. That's important stuff. So with all that said, I had to lay the groundwork for Psalm 116. Because I know how this church thinks. So it's kind of like we're delivering a sermon. kind of like an attorney in a courtroom at this church, isn't it? I present my case. So bold prayers, sometimes God answers them, right? Sometimes you have a bold prayer and God's like silent. But I'm going to do other things. 
When you look at Psalm 116, it is a bold prayer, flat out, and God answers this bold prayer. Uh, and we want to talk about this because this is, uh, especially in the day in which we live, the times in which we live, how complex our times are, geopolitically, nationally, morally, racially, etc. What are we to learn? So here is my motif, and uh, it's, it's a, I've not ever done a, a theme like this one before because the passage warrants it. The main idea of this passage is this, and it's conditional. It's not when, it's an if. It says, if God delivers from peril, what should we do? Was saints, Christians, should move from uh, should move to performance, doing what I should be doing as a Christian, what I've told God I'm going to do. We're going to get to that in just a minute, and then I should praise Him, and not just praise Him internally, but I should praise Him publicly. That when God does something miraculous in my life, powerful in my life, I should perform the vow that I promised Him during the time I was pleading for Him. Oh God, if you just do this for me, I will do X for you. That's a vow, and then I will praise you publicly. Uh, have you completed those two things if God's delivered you? But notice it's, it's if, it's not when, uh, because uh, God is in control of all things. So consider, consider Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah in Lamentations chapter 3 uh, says this after the fall of the nation of Israel. Who is there who speaks and it comes to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? You can't even speak unless God is sovereignly part of it. He says, is it not from the mouth of the Most High bo that both good and ill go forth? He, he controls all of these things for purposes beyond that which we can imagine. So whether it is, is a good outcome for you or it is, it is a, a non-optimal outcome for you, God looks down from heaven and says to you as a child, don't worry, I'm working even in that to do things you, that you cannot even begin to understand. So walk with me in faith. So God, for, con he providentially con controlled the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, 586 B.C. It happened in three waves. First wave was 605 B.C. when the Babylonians attacked. Uh, and eventually they lost their whole nation. He was providentially in control of that. And then he was providentially in control of returning the nation back to uh, where they were from, uh, from Babylonian captivity when the Persians freed them in 539. He was in control of all of those things. Reminds me of Romans 8. What does Romans 8 say? Uh, you should know it well. And we know that God causes all things, not just some things, all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. If you are a Christian, you're called. Uh, you're a called one. Uh, and you can know that all things means everything in your life. Down from a, a child with special needs, I've been there, I've done that one. You know, down, job loss, whatever it is, catastrophe in a nation, all of those things, God says he looks down from heaven and says, in a sinful world that's broken. I've got this because I, my hand is always on the wheel because he's providential. So do you believe it is the thing? Uh, he has called us in his sovereignty, if you read uh, the words of Jesus, uh, to ask, seek, and knock. And they're all participles because participles matter to God, do they not? Because it's a constant action. It's a, I must, he says, when it comes to prayer, go to the door of heaven and knock. Lord, I need, I need this for my daughter. Lord, I, I need this for my husband, etc. Knock. Ask, seek, and knock. And what does he say? The door will always be closed unto you. Does he say that? No. He says, ask, seek, and knock, and the door shall be opened. Uh, and we'll talk about that because God opens the door for the things you're asking for. And sometimes he grants them to you as you ask in bold faith. And sometimes he fulfills them to you in ways you did not anticipate. Uh, and so when we look at these things, uh, that if God delivers you at a time you've prayed a bold prayer, what should you do? I should perform what I told him I would do when I was like giving him a vow, uh, and then I should praise him publicly. Uh, but let's look at how all that develops when we look at the passage. Three movements in the passage. Number one is um, perspective is everything. Per perspective is everything. Uh, I don't know if you've been to Chicago, uh, when my, uh, best friend, Rick Seeley, the head of homicide was uh, dying from pancreatic cancer. His last wish was he wanted to go to Disney world when he was still ambulatory and he wanted to go to Chicago. <laughs> go, go figure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so we did, we, while he was still ambulatory, uh, he was whittled down from cancer from 300 pound power lifter guy to, I think he was about 180 when we got there. And so we flew to Disney World, spent a couple days there, flew up to Chicago, had some awesome pizza, pizza, went to some great places, went to the top of the Sears Tower. Do you like heights? It was the, I think it was the 103rd floor. We got up there, and you're looking out the glass down below, and I'm like, I don't even know who worked on this building, but it would not have been me. But um, anyway, so we took a picture of a window cleaner. <laughs> 
I don't think Liz is here, so we can talk about her right now. But <laughs> so this is Liz back in 2007. Uh, looks like she's where? Outside the building. Uh, is she outside the building? No, 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 she's not outside the building. But anyway, uh, you can take that slide away. It's probably embarrassing her. So uh, I think it's cute. So we put her out there with these little scrub brushes, and you know, and it was just a, it was just a, a fake thing. But the perspective is everything. She wasn't really outside the building, right? Just, it just kind of looks that way. So when you face difficulty and you want to pray a bold prayer, prayer for God uh, to do something, realize your perspective about God is everything. How you view God. That's why I've just spent so much time talking about him. Talking about him. Notice what he says in verse 1 about perspective. The psalmist says, I personally love the Lord. Why? Why does he love the Lord? He tells you why in that causal clause. Because he does what? He hears my voice and my supplications. And then secondly, because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I'm going to call upon him as long as I live. He's a God who listens to me. See, there's no time that God, you ever pray to God, no matter what's going on, where God tells you, not listening. <laughs> no, no, he's like, I, I, I always listen to my children. Uh, I might not give them everything that they want, but, but I do hear them. And the psalmist says, I love God because when I've prayed out to him in a desperate time, he indeed hear me. You know, shame to those in our culture who would say, why would you want to pray at a difficult time in our nation? Why would you want to do that? I heard a guy say this yesterday about, you know, not praying for things. It's, you know, it's a fatalistic, it's just going to happen. Things are going to go the way they're supposed to go. And you're wasting your time praying it. No, no, I'm not. If I'm going before the throne of the living God and he promises to hear his people, then stand back and watch God work. Amen. See? So uh, Psalm 34, uh, verse 15 says this about God. The eyes of the Lord are on who? Who's that? You can put your name in there. The eyes of the Lord are on, put your name in there. Uh, and his ears are attentive to whose cry? Yours, yours. It also says the righteous cry out and the Lord never listens to him. See, the whole concept of God hearing you means he's going to act. That's how, that's how, he, that's how he operates. Uh, Proverbs 15, verse 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. This is why you would want to become a Christian. Because he just told you, if you're not my child, I'm not listening to you. But if you're my child, just like a father would listen to a son. Son, come here. I need, I need to, yeah. What, what would you say? He says, I hear, I hear my children. So he always hears and he always acts. He's never static. He's always dynamic. I'll say it again. He always hears. He's never static. He's always dynamic. Talk to him. He'll hear you. Uh, remember old Jonah? He, uh, he prayed to God, didn't he? Uh, when, <laughs> again, don't tell me the Bible's boring. The guy is, is locked up in uh, what the Hebrew calls a dag. A dag is a large fish, not a whale. Uh, but a large fish. He's in there in the darkness, wrapped up in seaweed, uh, all the acidic gases. Imagine the smells. It, it, imagine you're alive in there. Wouldn't you want to pray? <laughs> What'd he do? He prayed. Read chapter two. Oh, Lord, deliver me. He gets delivered. Uh, it, it tells us in the Hebrew text that the fish swam back the direction he was running from, spit him out on land. Oh, that must have been pleasurable. But God heard him, right? Gave him, it was a bold prayer. God saved me from the belly of this fish. And he did. Uh, we talked about Hannah a couple of weeks ago. Baron, once a child, uh, is, is harassed by uh, her husband's other wife. Uh, and, and they're having this huge argument. And she's taunting her. And she's praying to God, give me a child. And I will dedicate that child to you. God grants her this bold prayer, doesn't he? But he doesn't always do that. But he, but he did. Uh, and listen to her, what she says after the fact. 1 Samuel chapter 2 says that then Hannah prayed and said, this is after God gives her Samuel, the prophet and king, kingly type. Hannah said, uh, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks what? Boldly against my enemies be because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is no one like the ho holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides thee. There is no, there is no rock like our God. The Lord kill. Notice the sovereign, sovereignty, how she understands God. The Lord kills, and he makes alive. He brings down to Sheol, that's the grave, that's death, and he raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. In fact, God just destroyed Marxism and socialism in that one little statement. Did you notice that? God makes poor and makes rich. And it's not bad to be rich. If you worked hard and earned it, who gave it to you? God did. 
for his purposes. He brings low, he exalts, he raises the poor from the dust, he lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he set the world on them. He owns the planet. This is coming from a little handmaid who said, I prayed a bold prayer for God as a barren woman, and God saw my prayer, heard my prayer, heard my cry, and out of his graciousness, he saw fit in his will to grant me a child, and I gave that child back to God, and that child became Samuel, the great man of God. That's a, she has a very mature view of God, doesn't she? Why does she love God? Be, not just because he heard her and did what she wanted him to do, because she understood that God is sovereign. He makes poor, he makes rich, he brings people down to the grave, he gives people life. She said, either way that it goes, I love that God. That's a mature woman right there. So as you walk through life, perspective is everything, correct? Your perspective about God. Um, will you follow God no matter what is the question. Uh, Jesus said this in uh, Luke chapter 11. Let's remember the Lord's words. Now suppose he says, one of your fathers is asked by his son for a fish. Uh, he, he will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? No, I mean, what father would do that? That'd be cruel. Uh, what else does he say? He says, if he asks for an egg, uh, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? Answer to the rhetorical question is, no, what dad would do that? Uh, if you then being evil, uh, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So it's the argument from the lesser to the greater. If you as a dad, if you as a mom, when a child comes to you and asks you for something, hey mom, can I have, hey mom, can I? You're not going to give them something that you know, oh, that'll show them, that's a scorpion. No, you would never do that. Uh, but he says, if you only give them good things that are good for them, uh, then what does God do? He, he's better than that. He's way beyond that. So when I, I pray my prayer of boldness for him, whatever my situation is, God can take the complexity of whatever it is I'm asking him to help me with, and he, sometimes he will answer that in a profound way. Sometimes his profound answer is the opposite of that, but the answer is so amazing. It, I know he gave me that which is good, because from the difficult things can come great things. Do you, do you believe the Lord's like that? Because I can tell you, when you're in the middle of adversity, and God rocks your world, a lot of Christians get rocked because they think bad things about God. Yeah, he just gave me a scorpion. No, he doesn't. He never does that. He gives you what is good for you, what he knows that you need. Now, think about it as a parent. If your ch child's asking you all the time, can I have a Twinkie? Can I have a Twinkie? Can I have a Twinkie? Are you going to give him a Twinkie? And after that, could I have a Costa? Uh, Pastor Marty said, you know, parents always give good things to their children. Could I have a, a cupcake now? Like, <laughs> no. A parent only gives the child what? What is good for them? What is good for them? Maybe what you're asking God for is not, he knows it's not good for you. So just trust that his answer is the best. So provision, his, uh, his um, answer to you uh, is all about his perspective, how you view him. Number two, provision in your perilous times is what you need to look for when you pray a bold prayer of faith. I'm, I'm not making a whole bunch of Hebrew text analysis and words this morning because uh, I want to get on to something else at the end of my sermon. So I'm going to look at verse three, start reading this and talk about God's provision for this guy who prayed. He says, the cords of death encompassed me. I was almost dead. He says, the terrors of Sheol came upon me. I could, I could sense my mortality ending. He says, I found distress and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. What did he say? Quote, O Lord, I beseech thee, save my life. Then what happened? That was a bold prayer. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. The Lord preserves the simple. He says, I was brought low because God will bring you low at times to teach you. And he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For thou hast rescued my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I shall walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed when he said, I am greatly afflicted. Boy, I was. And, he, and I said in my, in my, in my uh, affliction, all men are liars, meaning my friends were counseling me like Job's friends, and the counsel wasn't good. Boy, I've been there. You're in a te terrible time, and people around you are telling you things that are, well, they're not doctrinally sound. He said, God, I just kept my perspective on who you are, and I prayed a bold prayer, and you answered it in a profound way. And he says, I, I, I just, I just want to thank you. God delivered him. God delivered him. Does God always deliver? No, no, but sometimes he does. Sometimes he does. Um, how should you 
when you look at him, how did he say God responded to him? Graciously, bountifully, unexpectedly. Because he said, I, I can sense death is nigh. And I prayed out to you and you, and you saved me. And 1 John chapter 5, uh, verse uh, 14 is a very important principle when it comes to praying boldly for God to do something and thinking about how God thinks. Uh, verse 14 says this. This is the confidence that we have before him, speaking of Christ, uh, that if we ask anything according to what? His will, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we asked for from him. My whole fair, prayer is predicated on one major thing. What is it? His will. I can't go into God's throne room and tell him, I, as a pastor of a church in Washington, D.C., I demand that you do this for me. What would happen to me in God's throne room? Little lightning, little vaporization. <laughs> Marty, you need to go back uh, to the waiting room for a little bit. Who would ever waltz into God's presence with that audacious uh, life full of much hubris? Who would do this? I, I would not. Because it says when you're asking something bold for God, you must ask him, Lord, I can pray boldly, but I preface it with, may it be according to your will. Not my will. I want your will to be done, because remember, his will is way off the grid of what he will accomplish. Hezekiah, the king, was a man of great prayer, uh, and twice he prayed great prayers, and twice God uh, freed him. One time he prayed, when his nation is surrounded by the Assyrians, he prayed for God to deliver him, because their, their country is about to be destroyed by the Assyrians, uh, and the, their enemies mocking them on the wall, and I mean, it's, it's terrible. Uh, and he knows what's going to happen if the nation falls. I won't go into uh, Syrian warfare techniques because I wrote a major paper when I started my doctorate in, uh, back in Hebrew back in uh, 85. Uh, I did a whole paper on the concept of holy war in the Old Testament. Uh, you would not want the Assyrians to, uh, to level your city. They, they were like the ancient Taliban. And he prayed and God delivered him. God sent one angel. One wipes out the entire Assyrian army just passing through the camp. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about what happens in chapter 20 of 2 Kings. The king's about to die. God, they, they come to him. The prophet comes to him and tells him, uh, God has said, you're not going to live much longer. Verse 1, it says, in those days, the king became mortally ill. Uh, and, and Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order. You shall die and not live. Imagine the prophet of God comes and comes. <laughs> yeah, what's up? Uh, God just gave me a word for you. Oh, yeah, what is it? Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, you're probably not going to live, but in a couple more days. Uh, okay, what did he do? Uh, he turned his face to the wall in depression, and he prayed to the Lord, saying, quote, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked in thy way of truth with a whole heart. I've done, I've done good what is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah, he wept bitterly. And it came about before Isaiah had gone out of the middle of the court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, because God has heard the prayer of the king, uh, return, uh, uh, return to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, and uh, say, thus says the Lord, uh, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer, because God always hears the prayers of his saints. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will uh, deal with you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord, the, the, the temple, and I will add how much time to your life? 15 years. I'll give you 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my uh, servant David's sake. I heard your prayer, and I was going to take you out, but I've changed my mind, and I'm going to... Did he ask for 15 years? No. God says, I'm going to graci graciously give you, as the king of the nation, 15 more years, because you prayed a bold prayer. Did God answer that prayer? Absolutely, he did. So what should you do when you're in a tough situation? Pray a bold prayer to God. Amen. Bold prayer. Do not ever look at a situation and go, all hope is lost. His nation is facing invasion. And he's about to die as the king. And he's like, what's going to happen to my nation? And he, I got to be here at the helm guiding the nation. God says, okay, I'll, I will give you 15 years. I'll answer that prayer. Don't be afraid to pray a bold prayer. Uh, I was uh, told uh, at my last church years ago, back in the 90s, uh, to go to the home of one of our parishioners. Her name was Lydia Grout, Lydia. A little white-haired lady, very stately. She had married, I think she was married to a former senator from Oklahoma. Uh, very uh, nice lady, great lady. Uh, and she had a brain aneurysm on her, on her head, a uh, huge one, and it was going to blow. Uh, and so the, the, her neurosurgeon told her, uh, meet with your pastor, say your last rites, 
you're going to enter into God's presence immediately. So I went over to her house with the head of our elder board, uh, Gary Moore was his name, uh, took communion cups uh, with us. Uh, and we sat with her, we prayed with her, took communion cups, and I took a vial of oil. And according to the scriptures, I anointed her head with oil, and Gary and I laid hands on her and prayed for her. Not that I'm a healer, but that was on a Sunday night. Monday, she went to see the surgeon one last time, and he did a brain scan, no aneurysm. Z zero. Now, I will tell you, as a pastor, I've prayed for many people in my lifetime. God does not always answer that bold prayer to heal that woman. She was 80 years old, and God healed her. She eventually, yeah, she went on to live like another seven or eight years. Later, she wound up in a, in a, a rest home, and she asked me while she was in the rest home, I went to go see her, uh, and she wasn't mobile now and couldn't walk, and I went in there, and she was crying, and I said, let me put you in the wheelchair and wheel you out to a fountain out in the sunshine uh, so I did. I wheeled her out there, and I came next to her, and I said, Lady, why, why are you crying? She said, <laughs> she said, why did God spare me an old woman? Why did he do that? Because, you know, sometimes he takes young people. Why did he spare an 80-year-old woman? And I said, well, Lydia, do, do your nurses know Christ? I don't think so. How about your roommate? Does your roommate know Christ? Not from the way she talks. And I said, well, you know what, Lydia? You're on divine assignment because you are here 24-7. You are God's witness to the nursing staff, to that, to that lady next to you, and God has positioned you here to win them to Christ with the gospel. The rest of her life, she had a mission. And why did God save that old woman from aneurysm? She eventually died from something else. But no, he prayed that that bold prayer was answered so God could use her to reach other people for him. That's how God works. I don't question his ways. Do you question his ways? Uh, I don't. But, but I still say the, the bold prayer is an amazing prayer. Uh, 20, uh, see, back in, um, what is this? 2021. Um, in 2008, on this day was the day my dad died at 6 o'clock, August 22nd, from brain cancer. Do you think that we as a family failed to pray for God to do something bold for my dad? <sighs> yeah, many times. And he was a godly man. Uh, did, did God answer the prayers of our godly family? Not in the way we prayed. Uh, but, but God answered them in other ways. Profound ways. Like daily for weeks, the hallways being full of old people, young people, high school students, college students, lined up outside his door in the rest home, coming to see the man who had had an impact on their faith. People of all nationalities. And the nurses would stop us in the hallway and they would say, who is this guy? He's like he's some kind of celebrity. No, he was a godly man who loved all people and impacted them. See, when I was praying for healing, God goes, no, I'm going to give you something greater. I'm going to allow you to see things that you wouldn't have got to see before. Um, like the, the nurse who was in his room one day crying as she made his bed. And he was in the restroom and she was crying. And I asked her, oh, why are you crying? And she said, uh, I love your dad. And I go, well, I do too. And she said, well, I, I wish he was my dad. I never had a dad like that. He's a godly man. <laughs> I mean, God answered my prayers in many ways, right? So I just say, we prayed boldly. God didn't answer. So in obedience, you must say, God, I, we asked boldly. You didn't answer. And so we, we, we follow your will. But you've answered in other ways. And when God does answer and do profound things, what should you do? Well, uh, you should perform uh, your, well, what you said you were going to do. Let's read what he says. Perform your vows to God. He says, I'll lift up my cup of salvation. I'll call on the name of the Lord. I'll pay my vows to the Lord. Oh, that it might be in the presence of all of his people publicly when I do this. Precious in the sight is, is, of the Lord is the death of all of his godly ones. Because he's saying sometimes God takes you out and, and takes you home. Other times, like he says in my life, he, he gave me life. He says, O Lord, surely I am thy servant. I am thy servant, the son of thy handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. To thee I will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. I'll call upon the name of the Lord. I'll pay my vows to the Lord. He has already said this before. Uh, oh, oh, may it be in the presence of all the people. He's already said that before. He says it again. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, I will praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord. 
But in the middle of all that praising God for delivering him, we have to realize that sometimes that bold prayer is answered and other times it's not answered. There's that balance in the Christian life, is there not? So I'll show you my dad's headstone and what we put on it. Um, I think we have this picture there. His name was Geddes, Geddes Albert Baker, uh, 1830, uh, 1932, 2008. And in the middle it says, for me to live is Christ, to die is what? It's gain, gain. Because it was heaven's gain that day, that Friday night at 6 o'clock on August 22nd. We realize that it's, every time a saint dies, it's precious in God's sight. Whether it's an 8-year-old or it's an 80-year-old, it's precious in God's sight. But sometimes God moves in a profound way and delivers. And when God delivers you, you should do two things. Number one, perform the vow that you promised to, to do and praise him publicly. Let me think about that for just a second. Praise God for the vow. Because a lot of people will say, God, if you get me out of this situation, I'll become a missionary. I'll join the church staff. I'll lead worship. Just do something. Well, maybe he did. Have you fulfilled the vow you gave to God? Then you, today's the day to say, God, I'm going to do that vow. And I'll also back up and say, I understand life is very complicated. And it might have been 30, 40 years since this all transpired and God gave you his uh, uh, miraculous answer. Maybe you can't pay your vow and you've drug around guilt your whole life because of it. God's also compassionate and merciful. So if you, you go before God and you say, God, I, I, there's no way I could fulfill that vow now. Well, then forgive me and God shall. But if you can still fulfill it, what should you do? Do it. Do it. Do it. And then lastly, he says, praise, I will praise you publicly among your people. And he says it twice. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. This is public, isn't it? The rhetorical question demands a positive response. <laughs> I'm going to give you a proposition here. Uh, I have some mics up here. I don't want you to come preach. I want you to praise God. I want it to be short, concise, but if he's done something that you want to praise him for, where you prayed that bold prayer and God answered that, just come up to the mic and just say, I don't want the whole history. I just want, I praise God for X, and then just walk away. Because we're commanded to praise God publicly. So if I don't let you do it, I've sinned. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. So why don't we stand? And don't be bashful. Short and sweet, you're, this is not to me, this is to the Lord, fulfilling the scriptures. God, thank you for doing X for me. Praise him. There's three mics. We praise uh, God for answering those bold prayers, and may he be praised. And may you move quickly for the next service to come in. <laughs> that will be a miracle. Uh, God bless you. Have a great day.